Guy Elsie. I'm the president of the 9-11 Tribute Center. I'm also a board member of the 9-11 Memorial Museum. The 9-11 Tribute Center was started almost a decade ago by myself and Jennifer Adams. We brought together people who were deeply affected by 9-11 and built a community that is devoted to preserving and sharing their 9-11 experiences. We felt the need to give a voice to those people who had their voices stolen from them on 9-11. It's great to see so many people here. I want to welcome you all to the 9-11 Tribute Center presentation of We Were There. My name is Judith Pucci, and I am the Tribute Center Walking to a God. As you just heard in the film, we at the Tribute Center are people who have all been directly affected by the events of September 11th. And I can tell you that we are a diverse group. We come from different backgrounds or different ages. In the normal course of life, many of us would never have met. Now, we share a powerful bond. And the Tribute Center is it's our home base. It's where we find support, and it's where we tell our stories about what September 11th was like from the inside. Today, you're going to hear two of these stories, and you're going to hear them by the people who lived them. Two of my fellow Tribute Center guides, right next to me, you have Richie Birch, and next to Richie, you have Cynthia Tomoki Olivar. Cynthia, on September 11th, was an elementary school teacher. She was out on maternity leave. Her baby daughter, Caroline, was four months old, and her older girl, Sarah, was three years old. Cynthia's husband, Lance Tomoki. Lance worked for Bureau Brokers. It was a financial services firm on the 84th floor of the South Tower. Now, the South Tower is the building that was hit second. Richie, on September 11th, was a deputy chief with the New York City Fire Department. If you see a little smile, that's because I have great respect for our fire department. Later, in February of 2002, Richie was assigned to Ground Zero as a Deputy Incident Commander. Before that, he had been working, however, on the pile, as what was down here was called. We're going to begin with Cynthia's story, so I'm going to set the scene for you before Cynthia begins to speak. As I mentioned, Cynthia's husband, Lance, worked up in the South Tower. Now, the second plane struck the South Tower at 9.03. 17 minutes earlier, the first plane hit the North Tower. That is all that separated the two attacks, 17 minutes. 
Lance was at his desk on the 84th floor of the second building of the South Tower. He was at his desk at the time. September 11th was my daughter's first day of preschool. As I was getting her ready that morning and feeding my newborn daughter, uh, my husband Lance called me. And he called me from his office on the 84th floor of the South Tower. And he called to tell me that a plane or something, wasn't sure, had just hit the other tower. And he was fine, he loved me, and he would call me later. So with that information, I continued getting my daughter ready for school. And as we were leaving a little while later, I had turned the TV on. And just as I was about to step foot out that door, I heard the news reporter scream, oh my God, oh my God, it's another plane. And I turned at that exact moment that I watched that second plane fly into the South Tower. My knees buckled a little, because, and they had never done that before. Um, and with that, I put my daughter, Sarah, in the car, and I took her to preschool. And we did all the normal things that you do on the first day of school. We met her teacher, we took pictures, and we visited her classroom. And I waited there. I waited uh, till school was over, um, afraid of what I might have to deal with or find out when I got home. As we drove up the driveway a few hours later, a little voice from the back seat asked me, Mommy, why are there so many cars in our driveway? And I did what I think any mother would do under the circumstances. I lied to her, and I told her that they were all there to celebrate her first day of school. As I got out of the car, I was met with people friends, relatives, neighbors, all wanting to know the same thing. Where was Lance? Had I heard from him? And was he okay? And I can only begin to describe what happened in those next few minutes, hours, and days as controlled chaos. Everyone who was there, who came, stayed, took on a different job. My dad's job was to field phone calls. My mom helped take care of my four-month-old daughter. My girlfriends took my daughter Sarah places. My girlfriend Lynn made missing posters with Lance's face on them. My job was to collect things like his toothbrush and hairbrush for DNA and to call the dentist to obtain his dental records for the chief medical examiner. My brother-in-law is Lance, Lance's older brothers, James and Sean. They had the most important job. They would wake up every day with my sister-in-law and my cousin and go into the city in hopes of finding out information about Lance. They would go in and canvas the city day after day. After a couple days, I got a phone call that they were on their way home and they wanted to meet with me. I told them that I didn't want to meet with them. When I saw my brother-in-law Sean's face, I would know whatever it is he needed to tell me. I was standing in the kitchen that night. Sean came around the corner. And he looked at me, and I looked at him, and he didn't have to say anything. I knew. He knew, I knew, we both knew Lance was not coming home. He had found out that Lance was standing at his desk at the moment of impact when that second plane hit the South Tower. So when I watched that plane, when my knees buckled, I had watched my husband be killed. Nothing of Lance has ever been recovered. I am one of the families who we have no remains. As everyone in the house that night began to find out the news, um, it was a beautiful night outside and we all went outside and we stood on the patio and there was music playing and we got in a circle and we put our arms around each other. And these were the words that we sang for a moment, all the world was right. How could I have known that you'd ever say goodbye? And now, I'm glad I didn't know the way it all would end, the way it all would go. Thank you.
mentioned that her family was among those who never received remains. As of today, 41% of everyone who died here at the Trade Center, their remains have not been identified. That means that that morning, about a little over 1,100 people vanished into thin air. Cynthia shares her story not only for Lance, but for the nearly 3,000 people who died at all three locations on that morning. Richie's story. Richie's story begins the day after September 11th, when he arrived at the Trade Center to help with the rescue and the recovery effort. By the following day, September the 12th, the day Richie showed up, tens of thousands of first responders from around the country had traveled all night to arrive here, and they had one hope to help save lives. Everyone in the city expected hundreds of people to be rescued from the rubble. As it turned out, the number was 20. Too slow. So I was standing on a, on a deck of a cruise ship coming back from vacation, coming into New York Harbor. In the morning mist, I could see the twin towers of the World Trade Center in front of me. The date was uh, September 8, 2001. It was a Saturday. The next day, Sunday, uh, I attended a birthday slash promotion party for uh, one of the chiefs that I had worked with down in Lower Manhattan. Uh, among the people that were there were my former aide, Mel Faustino, Apostle, and another chief that I worked with, Bill McGovern. When we parted ways that night, that was the last time I would ever see them again. The next day was my first day back to work. I was working in the South Bronx at the time. One of the things I did that day was attend a uh, dedication ceremony for a new firehouse. In the FDNY, when they have a new dedication or a new firehouse or a renovated firehouse, which is what this was, they usually have a ceremony, and there's usually a religious aspect to it. Among the people who spoke there were Father Michael Judge. Uh, some of you may know who that is. He was the um, beloved chaplain of the FDNY. Um, among other things he said in the homily were, God is a God of surprises. If you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans for tomorrow. <laughs> and it is ironic because the next day he died in the World Trade Center, uh, in, the, in the North Tower, number one World Trade Center. September 12th, I was assigned from the, from the South Bronx to respond to the World Trade Center. We got in the bus, there were several of us. Uh, we drove down the West Side Highway, which is the way you get from the Bronx to Lower Manhattan. And we had to get out at about Canal Street, which is several hundred yards north of um, the World Trade Center. We had to walk. We had to walk through several military checkpoints, people with uh, automatic weapons, soldiers. By this time, it had become a crime scene. It was a war zone. When I approached, um, the northern perimeter of the World Trade Center, which was Vesey Street, uh, the devastation that met me was just horrendous. I had seen it on the, on the television, I had spoken to people who had been down there, uh, but just seeing it was unbelievable. There were two piles of debris where the two twin towers had once stood. There was debris in the entire area. Um, there was smoke coming from the buildings that had been burning for the previous day, because there were seven buildings surrounding the World Trade Center. And the buildings across the street from West Street, the World Financial Center, all the windows had been blown out, because when the Twin Towers collapsed, it was like an earthquake, it blew out all the windows. And the smell, the smell is like a smell that I had never smelled before. And, um, I was in a fire department for 28 years. I smelled car fires, and building fires, and content fires, and every kind of fire you can think of. 
but I never had, a, I never experienced a smell like that, and I, I, rem I remember it to this day. Eventually, I was told to uh, take command of the operations on the pile that had once been the South Tower, number two World Trade Center. Now, that was a uh, dangerous and a solemn uh, operation because we were searching for, for uh, survivors at that time. It was still a rescue operation at that point. Some of you may remember the bucket brigades. There were people on the piles, and I mean like a couple of hundred people on that pile, just passing buckets up, filling them up with debris and passing them back down, dumping the debris and sending it back up. What they were doing was they were digging into the voids, trying to hope they could find somebody alive. But as it turns out, um, after September 12th, there were no more people to be rescued. There was only a recovery operation to be done. And that is what happened about two weeks later. They, they canceled or they canceled the re uh, rescue operation and then they called it a recovery operation. And when I say recovery, I mean recovery of uh, the remains of people who died. Um, so I worked there with several other people, many other people, till about twilight when I was told that we were going to be relieved uh, by somebody else, take a walk around the site, uh, handed in our radio, started walking up West Street to go find a bus that was going to take us back home. So by this time it started turning dark. We were in the bus, it was hot, it was September 11th, it was still summertime. We had the windows open, we were driving up West Street, and all of a sudden, we started hearing noise. And we didn't know what it was. Looking out, it sounded like a demonstration or uh, people screaming, uh, some kind of parade. I had no idea what it was. As we approached, uh, we realized there were people there to support us. Um, they were carrying banners. They were just saying words of support, and there were hundreds of them. So to me, that um, symbolized how everybody came together after 9-11. Uh, everybody pitched in. There were people who came down from the Red Cross, from the Salvation Army, from numerous organizations, and just individuals that came to help. And also, that was the first time that I felt any emotion, because um, I had been on auto working on automatic pilot for that whole time since the tragedy happened, and for several months after. I was assigned to uh, work at the, at the uh, World Trade Center site for the month of February 2002. A recovery operation had been going on since 9-11 or since the rescue operation had completed, and I was assigned just to work at the World Trade Center for the month of uh, February. Again, that was a very solemn time. Uh, whenever there was remains recovered, we would have a ceremony. Um, and it was a difficult time, both emotionally and physically. When the month was over, and we were going to go back to work in our firehouses, we were all gathered in a um, construction trailer, and uh, we were going to be given a sort of a debriefing. The construction trailer, as I recall, was dark, and I think that was kind of by design. So, you know, they basically gave us a debriefing, told us, listen, uh, if anybody thinks they need it, counseling's available. So we're all a bunch of big, tough fine. We said, counseling? We don't need any stinking counseling. <laughs> but I went back to work uh, in the field, and I realized that things weren't right with me. So <sighs> I was angry. I was hyper-vigilant, I was stressed out, I had anxiety, um, I wasn't right. So I finally decided I was going to seek out the council, and I did. And so uh, they helped me a lot, and with the help of my friends, my family, my fellow firefighters, <sighs> sorry. I was able to recover. And today I tell my story at the September 11th museum, and I continue to recover. Thanks.
each of those people who were screaming support. Mm -hmm. I was one of them. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a resident, so I know exactly the experience that Richie was describing here. I'm going to talk just a little bit about the cost to the first responders that day. 343. That is the number in one morning of firefighters who were killed here at the World Trade Center. 343. It was an unprecedented loss of life for our fire department. Also, 23 New York City police officers did. 43, no, excuse me, 33 Port Authority police did. September 11 stands as the worst loss of life for first responders in a single event in United States history. For Richie, telling his story is something that, as you heard, he does for his own recovery, but he also does it because it gives voice to his friends and colleagues who today are no longer. What I would like to do now, and I don't know if you were forewarned, it sometimes comes a bit of a shock to the audience, but we're going to open this up for questions. If anyone has anything that they would like to ask, Cynthia or Richie, this is the moment. This is not unusual. People are really overwhelmed at this point. Wow, a great soul right there. I think we have a microphone, yes. Thank you both for the beautiful stories you shared. I have a question for you, Sophia. Um, it was so emotional. Isn't it difficult for you to stand up here and tell your story? Um, yes, it is. <laughs> um, it's hard to. I like relive it every time I tell it. Um, but it took me a long time to come back to the nine, for 12 years I, I raised my children, I got remarried. I was a teacher before 9-11 and I feel like if, if I can help other people understand what families, all those, all those names out there on the memorial, um, not the stuff you can read in the, in the books, but if I can help people understand what the families behind all those names went through and continue to go through every day. The mothers who lost sons and children who lost parents. Um, if I can help do that, then I feel like that's my job here. Anyone else? Oh, we have another brave soul right there. If you just raise your hand again so the microphone can get to you. Counseling was mentioned, um, and I just graduated as a social worker from NYU, so we learn a lot in school as far as how to deal with these situations, traumatic events, um, and I wanted to hear from both of you, what was something that helped you to, to get through that recovery? Okay. Um, well, as you probably know, uh, you know, going for counseling, going for that kind of help kind of has a stigma to it. And certainly I didn't, when I first went, I didn't want anybody to know I was going. You know, it was that kind of thing. And it was difficult. And I think even to this day, uh, it's difficult for people coming back from, you know, uh, as soldiers to seek that kind of help. Uh, but, uh, you know, there is definitely something going on. And certainly I received a lot of help. And, you know, I was able to recover, you know, from some of the experiences that I was going through. Thank you. I also went, I went to counseling, um, but I also belong to a support group, and that was one of the best things. I um, unfortunately was in a support group with 63 other 9-11 widows, and I could never say why me, because we were all going through it, but I found that most helpful, just being with other people who, we, we can help each other through it. You know, from my point of view, we have, a, you know, in the fire department, we have a unique uh, organization where, you know, we help, we help each other. Um, that's not always available to everybody, but, I, you know, I think being part of the Tribute Center and, you know, like being together with others. Sorry. 
you know, that really helps me to kind of deal with it and, you know, have somebody that you can kind of commiserate with in terms of your experience and stuff like that. Yeah, in tribute, um, when you say uh, I was a first responder, uh, I'm a family member, I'm a survivor, in a, in a sense, that is all you need to say because you are with people who understand what that means in terms of the rippling out. So it's very much easier when you've gone through an enormous trauma, as both of them have, to know that there's not the need for explaining. It's understood. One more question, anyone? I have a quick question for Richie. Richie, in your story, you mentioned that the, when you found her names that there was a ceremony. Could you just briefly elaborate what that was? People on the tours are always fascinated by this. Well, uh, pretty much the uh, ceremony was for people in the service that we had recovered, and other firefighters, police officers. Um, uh, we were always dignified with any kind of uh, recovery, recovery that we had made, but uh, there was a particular ceremony where we would put the place in remains into like a stretcher, or, uh, it's called a stretcher, covered with a uh, American flag, and then have a procession from where we found it. Up. There was at that point in time a road that led up from the pit up into where the waiting ambulance would be, and, and then everybody saluted to make it a you know, brief stop, and, and that's how it ended up. I heard that a whistle was blown when the remains were found, and then everyone would stand, stop what they were doing, and then yeah. run again once the remains were all right. inside. Yeah, because what, what happened is that basically the work stopped. Right. Everybody uh, would get off of whatever pile or wherever they might be, and they would all gather and line up in a formation as you know the remains were removed from, uh, from the site. So they were treated with enormous dignity and mm -hmm. respect. Yes. Well, as much as I hate to do it, we're going to have to wrap up. So I want to do that with a question. The question is nothing that you have to answer, because you couldn't possibly. The question is, why do we tell our stories? That's one of the things we're asked most often on the tours. Why do you do this? It can't be easy. The reason will vary for everyone at Tribute. But what is common to us all is the belief that by telling our stories, we can demonstrate that September 11th was about more than loss, profound, devastating loss, absolutely but that it was also a day that demonstrated the absolutely incredible resilience of the human spirit. We tell our stories here at the museum because we hope that by hearing them, it will enrich your experience here in this extraordinary place. So I want to thank you, and I'm thanking you for a particular reason. I'm thanking you because you whether you know it or not, are really an essential part of our storytelling. Without you, we're talking to ourselves. So I want to thank you all on behalf of Tribute, on behalf of Sylvia, Richie, and me. Thank you for sharing your time with us.